what we're promoting, sustainable travel, responsible travel, is actually superior for the traveler. It's not just the right thing for the planet or the right thing for the local community or whatever, or the environment, but it, but it, is, it actually provides a superior vacation. So we're selling a better product. And, um, and so we, we don't need to apologize for trying to get people to do the right thing. <laughs> Dr. Martha Honey and Kelsey Frank Keel are my guests on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Martha is CEO of Responsible Travel Consulting and co founder and former executive director of the Center for Responsible Travel, CREST based in Washington, D.C. Her previous books include Cruise Tourism in, in the Caribbean, Selling Sunshine by Rutledge Press, Ecotourism and Sustainable Development, Who Owns Paradise by Island Press, and Ecotourism and Certification, Setting Standards and Practice, also by Island Press. She worked as a journalist for 20 years based in Tanzania and Costa Rica, more at responsibletravelconsulting.com. You can go and find out more about her long history and the work that she's done. Kelsey is a program manager at Crest, where she manages research and consulting projects related to responsible travel and supports fundraising activities and manages the internship program. Kelsey is also a freelance travel writer and researcher having supported publications for National Geographic Traveler, The Washingtonian, and other outlets. Before COVID-19 hit, over-tourism was the biggest problem in the world of travel. Then, seemingly overnight, tourism nearly ceased. But as travel resumes, will we return to a world of overrun monuments, littered beaches, bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic in national parks and gridlock cities? Or can we create sustainable, healthy tourism centered on principles like equity, conservation, and good governance? This wonderful book, Over Tourism, I have it in my hand here, holding it up, Lessons for a Better Future, publication that was released May 2021, this year, by Island Press, was edited by Martha Honey and co-founder and former executive of the Center for Responsible Travel and Kelsey, who are both my guests on the program today. And we're gonna talk about this book and over tourism and travel and any of our other questions that we have about this thing that probably everybody wants to have now. We, we wanna get back to getting out of the house and and start traveling again. So welcome both of you to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you, Mark. Well, I want to start out with the, the absolute first question, because I, I do genuinely care about both of you, although we have never met live. I love your writing. I've followed your work before. I follow Chris, so I know um, what you guys do and what wonderful uh, consulting and services and help you you provide in general for the industry. And my question really is, how have you weathered this crazy time? It, it hasn't just been COVID and a pandemic. It's been Brexit and an inauguration and Black Lives Matters and Asian racism. And it just seems to go on with more craziness. Not that now even Delta variations. And so I wanna know, how has that affected you in your own lives? But were there maybe some learning lessons because you both have such a wonderful bio and resume and been doing this for a while. Are there any lessons for resilience that you've learned or are there any things that you're seeing in the, this uh, over tourism industry, tourism and hospitality area that are getting better or worse or more people knocking down your door for help and consultation. And, and since we'll go with, with a senior, if you don't mind, honey, Martha, honey, please uh, start first. And then 
we'll go to Kelsey and then then I'll let you guys fight over the rest of the questions who takes the lead and who doesn't. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be part of this show and um, and to be with my dear friend Kelsey and talking about our new book and life in general. So to your question, the pandemic, how have I fared? Um, on a personal level, it's been a little bit of an up and down. I did get COVID, even though I thought that I was you know, not anywhere near anybody with COVID um, and was doing everything that I, I and my family was telling me I needed to do. But I, it was a relatively mild case. The, unfor the unfortunate part was that I did have what is now being called long haul COVID um, symptoms afterwards, which I'm still um, grappling with, although I, I must say I'm, I am definitely feeling much better now. After taking my first not vacation, but travel experience, which was work for a project we're doing at Crest um, to Alaska, where I was for a couple of weeks last, getting back a couple of days ago. But in any case, it's, you know, it, it's been on a personal level um, uh, challenging. Um, and I've been part of a, a medical um, examination of what is this long haul um, what are the long haul symptoms? How do we cope with it? And so on. It's going on at, at um, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And, uh, and that's been interesting. And I've felt like I'm with a community of people who are really trying to figure out what's going on. But I, you know, it makes me feel that we're just not, we've got a, we've got a ways to go on COVID. We're not out of the woods. We don't know all of what we're going to be suffering long term and so on. So that's been on a personal level, on a personal level. Um, in terms of tourism and also partly on a, a, a personal level, what I um, got involved in locally in the town of Rhinebeck, where I now live, which is in the Hudson Valley in New York State, a beautiful little town, two hours outside of New York City and a destination for many weekenders coming out of New York City. And it was a retreat spot for many people um, from New York who really fled here, property values shot up and et cetera, et cetera, as people moved here because it was deemed to be probably safer than New York City. Um, but what I got deeply involved in was an organization that popped up um, during the pandemic called Rhinebeck Responds, and it was a civic organization focused on uh, two of the most vulnerable sectors of our community, the small business sector and the underserved community, mainly Latinos, Latinx, and, and uh, people of color who are kind of an underclass in, in the Rhinebeck area. And I focused on the small businesses working with them and really coming out of that one, we, I think we had a, a great deal of success. We developed a grants program for small businesses and we did an online auction of painted birdhouses by artists in town. And I don't know, just a whole bunch of fundraising activities, marketing, joint marketing, by the, the 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 stores, the shops in town, and so on, and basically most stores made it through. Most of the businesses made it through, and they're all sort of one of a kind um, owner operated businesses. We have no chain stores in the town, and so it was very important to us to, to, to the character of the place we live in, and to these small, you know, quite vulnerable businesses to try to keep them alive, and and we succeeded. Um, so that has been uh, that that was, you know, that was very um, gratifying, a lot of work, but to see the community come together on Zoom and so on and really, um, you know, pull together as a community was great. The other um, piece that I think came out of um, is more related to broader tourism that came out of the pandemic that was I, I, I didn't see it coming, but was what we have experienced with cruise tourism, that cruises early on were identified as sort of super spreaders of the vaccine, of, of COVID and were shut down. And so we've had a long period where cruises have not, cruise tourism has not been operating. And this has led to a lot of questioning, a sort of deeper questioning of, do we wanna to return to the same kind of large scale mass tourism uh, uh, that we've seen before? And you know, sort of questioning, deeper questioning of the impacts of over tourism as people began to see what life was like without cruises in places like Key West, Florida, places in 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 Alaska, Southeast Alaska that I just visited, 
places in Europe like Barcelona and Venice, Dubrovnik and so on. So, uh, and, the, and of course, across the Caribbean. So that has been very instructive and I'm sure Kelsey and I will talk more in our interview about what we've, what we've seen and so on. But I think that there have been some real lessons that have come out of the halt in cruise tourism for what, what the tourism industry might look like long-term or could look like long, longer term. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that that very personal, and I, I hope the, the long haul doesn't turn out to be the long haul and that they Thank fix you. it in the short term and that you'll you'll be okay. And um, really, the, the pandemic was a global citizen, and it didn't adhere to any nations or borders mm -hmm. or lockdowns. It, it, it found us one way or the other, and so I'm sorry to hear that you had to deal with that and that there was some rough effects. It sounds been and, and really because you've been doing this for such a long time and mm -hmm. um, you've been speaking about it at conferences and events, you've written about it. And um, it's interesting that it almost seems to me, and I, I'm not sure if it's if it's true, and I'd like you to confirm before to go up, Kelsey, is really. Did you kind of see some people coming and knocking down your door, coming to speak to you and say, hey, we should have started sooner. We should have done a little bit something sooner to, to, to fix this industry, to fix hospitality and tourism and get things in place and to be prepared because we're not. Uh, we're not prepared for when no one comes and we're not prepared mm -hmm. for when everyone comes. And we've got to kind of find a new system. Did did that happen at all? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure people were quite that articulate in terms of identifying what they want. But I think we saw, for instance, the development of a um, global um, uh, network of people in different port cities where cruise tourism takes place that for the first time came together. And it includes now about 30 different cities around the world. And this is this is unprecedented. This has not happened before. And they're meeting every week, and they're discussing, you know, what kinds of changes they would like to see, and so on. And there have been some real um, initiatives, like in Key West, and um, and so and several other places in Venice, and so on, where real changes are being made, and people are learning from one another. So I think there's some good sharing of information. And I think on a local level, what I've seen here is a real added. Um, kind of renewed appreciation for small is beautiful, for protecting the local community, for paying attention to the workforces involved in those communities, you know, respect for what we call the frontline workers in COVID, but that also hopefully will translate into tourism where we have a, a renewed respect for the, you know, the, the, the people who do the, the, the heavy lifting in tourism, the low paid workers who clean our rooms and, you know, um, and the ships and so on and so on in the tourism industry and that we should really you know be paying living wages to these people and and uh, giving them the respect that they that they deserve so i i think that there were some silver linings that are that are coming out of uh the the pandemic that at first i think many of us felt this that there's going to be there's just no good out of this you know sort of like the wildfires now in the west i mean what can you say is positive about this? But in the end, for you know, for many of us, I think it, it's been a mixed bag with with some really deep thinking and some silver linings in terms of lessons learned. Thank you so much, and and Kelsey, I appreciate you being so patient and waiting to to have your turn. But I would really like to hear from you and 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 um, find out how, how you weathered this and how it really ties to you. This is your life's work now that you do, and this is what you do every day and, and uh, what kind of how you weathered it and what the learning lessons were moving forward, especially as you, as you touched upon this a little bit in the book. And I also did in the introduction that um, COVID had played a big part in kind of a wake up call and seeing what's going on and what's, what's happening in this industry. And so I'd like to hear from you a little bit more. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. And as Martha said, working alongside her has been so enlightening and, and um, so many lessons learned from this book, um, which, you know, 
took us almost three to four years to pull together. Um, and a lot has happened in that time. Um, for me personally, during the pandemic, I, I'm based in Washington, DC. Um, and as a lot of organizations did, when the pandemic hit, we went remote. Um, so I think what was so profound to me and, and what I noticed right away was how unaffected I was and how privileged I was compared to other people who, who perhaps didn't have the privilege to be able to work from home and sit in their nice apartment every day and continue to do the work that they were doing. Um, and I think especially in Washington, DC, that socioeconomic inequity is really stark and visible. Um, there's a really strong um, traditional, traditional um, Black and, and BIPOC community living in, in DC. Um, and the numbers um, for what communities were, were really susceptible to COVID were really telling. And so that was kind of one of the things that, that came out for me. I think also just over the, what was it, over a year that we were all sitting indoors and, and quarantining. Um, you know, prior to that, I had been traveling every single month on a plane at least twice a month on trains and in cars and trying to get myself to places, to weddings, to, to work travel. Um, and it was too much. I, and, and to me, responsible travel is so much about actually being able to slow down and think about where you're going and, and what you're gonna do when you get there and really doing your research and learning about the place. I mean, I grew up, I grew up uh, traveling across the US with my family, going to our, our favorite thing to do was, was to go to Revolutionary War and Civil War sites and, and to learn about that history. Um, and that's what I love to do when I travel is, is learn about the place that I'm going to and its history. And traveling like that, you just don't have the time or the brain space to do that. And what COVID showed me is that if we really take the time to slow down, that's kind of the first step towards being a more responsible traveler. Um, and I'm really trying hard to, to keep that, um, uh, that, that slow approach to travel in my, in my new post COVID, I guess you could say life. It's really tough though. We're all global citizens these days. And um, the, a lot of us have friends all over the world and, and obligations and things like that. So I find it really tough and, and I work and live and breathe in this space every day. <laughs> so I, I, I understand that uh, it's not so easy for everyone to, to, apply those lessons from COVID to their everyday lives and their travel. Did, were there any like moments where um, for you now that you're, you're really day to day with Crest and, and by the way, this is, I, I explained it, but some of the listeners might have needed to listen a little bit closer. Crest is an acronym for Center for Responsible Travel, just in case uh, anyone hears us repeat that, but, but it's really um, a path towards tourism that is truly sustainable, focusing on the triple bottom line, people, planet, and prosperity. It's about bringing uh, together tourist, tourism officials, city council members, travel journalists, consultants, scholars, and trade association members that really can make an impact and come up with solutions to overcrowding and uh, address the multifaceted systems or problems in the area. And, and that's what your book talks about. Over Tourism is a fabulous book. I've read it twice. This is normally I don't get the physical copy in, in Europe quite as fast and I, and I have to only read it in digital, but it's really a, a beautiful thing. And there, there are a couple of things that I want to uh that you both have touched upon that I want to move forward in uh, before you answer that question about if, if anything comes up about Crest that we can come back to them later. One is how history and culture plays a big part in most tour tourism spots. And then Martha brought up uh, the cruise industry or cruise ships. And um, as an environmentalist, as somebody who's sustainable, 
um, th there are some different aspects of that as well that, that I want to make sure that we touch upon and address a little bit further into our conversation. So please don't let me forget to ask those questions. But what were some of the learning lessons? Were people calling you and emailing you and saying, you know, uh, you guys have gotten us together or you've talked about this. We really need help during this time. We need um, your, your support. Yeah, I think that um, COVID changed things in the travel industry in a few ways. Um, some of the problems that we were seeing, uh, for example, was that in a lot of outdoor spaces, so national parks, protected areas, beaches, places like that, um, were experiencing huge numbers of tourists in some cases, even surpassing their 2019 levels. Um, and the issue that um, the managers of these destinations were having, because you know there are people that um, their, their job is to manage these destinations and, and make sure that the visitors have a great experience, that the environment is protected and that communities benefit from this. Um, the issues that, that they were seeing were that um, some of the visitors coming to these places were what you might call atypical visitors. So, so people not um, very used to spending a lot of time in the outdoors um, and maybe not having those ingrained leave no trace principles um, that other travelers might have um, and leaving behind a lot of trash and, and pet waste and litter and things like that. Um, and what do we do about this? These are visitors that that might not be um, that might not be impacted by some of the traditional marketing that we're that we're used to giving visitors um, to take away their trash and things like that. Um, another issue that we were seeing is the stark opposite: um, places that are indoors, um, museums, um, places that are that are typically very crowded, like historic cities, um, that really lost. Um, what they're used to, that, that revenue through tourism, and how do we respond to, the, to that economic instability. So those are kind of the two sides of the coin. Um, one thing that Crest did when we realized um, that uh, collaboration was going to be a really important way to move forward um, was create the Future of Tourism Coalition um, together with, with five other uh, co-founders, other profits that are working in this space. Um, but what we wanted everyone to know is that this is an opportunity to really reset. We can take the lessons that we've learned from COVID and come up with a better future for the tourism industry. Um, and collaboration and not competition is the way forward. We came up with 13 um, guiding principles for the future of tourism. Um, so for example, uh, seeing the whole picture, um, tourism often isn't looked at very holistically, um, using better metrics. So not just measuring tourism by the number of people visiting, but what impacts they're having. Um, so those are kind of the steps that we took to, to chart a better path forward after COVID um, and the responses that we were seeing from people because of COVID and, and the new ways, the new challenges that they were dealing with. Martha, did you have anything to add to that? You seem to seem like when I was mentioning Crest that you you had something you wanted to say or, or did I misread? Maybe you misread. I think Kelsey, um, you know, explained very well what how Crest moved proactively to really pull together a coalition that was looking towards the future, which was, has been extremely important and, and Crest has played a leadership role in, you know, in, in helping to think about how to come out of this more sustainably to build back better, as we say. Great. I just did because we're dealing with the three of us on, on this podcast. I just want to make sure everybody gets their voice and I don't suppress any of your, your answers. Um, one thing that you guys both don't know about me is that my mother was the director of air traffic control for a, an airport in, in Stuttgart, Germany, 
and mm -hmm. later went on to be a United Nations translator. She spoke six different languages and later owned her own travel agency and was a tour guide. And, and wow. um, so through my mother, I have a wonderful experience. And, and um, you both know that I'm from the United States and living in Hamburg, Germany. The crazy thing is, is from my birth to today, I was raised as a global citizen, seeing not just my family mm -hmm. around the world, but experiencing culture and trips around the world from Italy to Austria to Germany to uh, the United States to Asia, Africa and, and South America. Um, lots of my, mo my mother did lots of tours and uh, tour guiding in Hawaii and, and a lot of traveling for the United Nations um, uh, as a translator in many different areas. And so um, I really got to see not only culture travel aspect, but then later when she owned her own agency, um, uh, kind of what that world looked like and, and how she, you know, when I was younger, she would travel a lot and give tours, but also to uh, learn about hotels or new resorts and, and mm -hmm. different destinations. And then, then when I got up into junior high school and high school, I actually went to work for her travel agency and became a travel agent myself. I first started out delivering tickets. And so I also got that glimpse in not only the computer back end, how do you book a ticket, but also how do you speak to the resorts and to the hotels and know a little bit about the destinations. Um, and, and so I, that's why also I read your book twice. I, I also like uh, Kelsey, uh, 2018, I had 200 events and, and um, 36 different countries um, around the world. And then in 2019, it went up to 220 events. Uh, mm -hmm. I was traveling probably four times a week and um, uh, luckily doing carbon offsetting and uh, through my companies doing some other offsetting measures and, and things and trying to visit as as many destinations that use certain principles in in hospitality and tourism um uh, crazy enough a lot of them were in asia which you would think that they, they wouldn't they might be somewhere else but there was a lot in asia that are really doing great things and in other places of the world but that that kind of leads me to why did you decide to write this book now and, and you said you've been working on it for three years but what were your thoughts and motivations um i know martha's history she's been doing this for a long time so it seems like a good fit but was there some telltale signs was there th something that motivated you guys to get there yeah well i think um in a way, the summer of 2017 was a real sort of tipping point uh, for for us at, at Crest. I was I was then um, the executive director of Crest, and and you know for a lot of people, sort of thoughtful people within um, the tourism space, uh, because what happened in the summer of 2017 was in the in the um, Caribbean where where we were doing a lot of work. We had projects, particularly in Cuba and uh, several other places in the Caribbean. But it, it was there were just sort of horrific um, hurricanes and um, that, that destroyed lots of tourism infrastructure since tourism infrastructure in the Caribbean tends to be on, on the coasts or on, on the water. And um, it, it, it was terrible uh, what, what was happening there. And it was also in, along the coastlines in the US and the Southern US as well. And, and over in Europe, what we saw was for the first time, public demonstrations against too much tourism, against what was eventually being called over tourism. And our realization that this problem of over tourism along with climate change were really the two biggest um, catastrophes facing the tourism industry. And uh, so we began to focus on, particularly on over tourism. We um, had already been doing some work on climate change. 
But Kelsey, maybe you should explain sort of what Crest moved to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so as Martha said, uh, <laughs> to, to use a careful term, shit really hit the fan <laughs> in, in 2017 and 2018. Um, and over-tourism had been defined um, in the years prior to that, but it really came to the world stage at that time. Um, and actually, um, I think we can credit a lot of news media for, for covering the problem and for being at the, the forefront of this and, and um, making sure the world knew. Um, and residents were really fed up. They were marching in the streets in, in Barcelona and Vez, uh, Venice, um, telling tourists to go home, that they were sick. Um, and, and not only you know, those day trippers, but in Venice, particularly the cruise tourists. Um, so Crest in 2018 uh, started off by hosting our World Tourism Day Forum, which is in September. We do this every year on over tourism and finding solutions. Um, coming out of that event, we took some of the case studies, we took some of those lessons learned and decided to, to come up with a book um, on these case studies and the solutions um, that they were facing. Um, also that year, we saw 1.5 billion tourists cross, cross international borders. And all of the projections were saying that this was only going to exponentially increase. Um, we never imagined that in the middle of writing this book, tourism would halt completely. Um, and I think in, in 2020, it was only something like 400 million international arrivals, which is still a huge number. Um, but for a time, it, it was halted completely and obviously brought on by a global health crisis. Um, but I think what we saw was that as we, as we touched on that COVID-19 triggered new and unique challenges for tourism. And it actually proved to us that this information was more timely than ever. Um, so we, we took that opportunity to really frame the book, um, talk about the pandemic and how this information could be used uh, moving forward. Maybe just going back a little bit, I, I uh wanted to mention that in the in the summer of 2017 when we were doing work in the Caribbean and the cities in in Europe were exploding I um, was invited to present a work that we had done on cruise tourism in the Caribbean at an academic conference in Barcelona and um, while I was there presenting I heard about a, a small conference that was also being organized in Barcelona on over tourism where they were inviting um, civic groups, academics, government officials from a bunch of key cities around Europe to come to Barcelona because Barcelona was already um, playing a leading role in trying to address over tourism. They had their, they had elected their first woman mayor and she had been elected on a, a ticket of control tourism. And so, in the midst of all of these demonstrations, and as Kelsey said, you know, signs saying tourists go home and so on, you know, anti-tourist movement in the streets, there was also the beginnings of efforts to find solutions. And so I was invited to attend this small conference in Europe, which was just eye-opening um, to, to really begin to hear, you know, both what cities were going through, but also how they were creatively beginning to come up with some ideas about solutions. I mean, it was all very tentative and a little bit piecemeal, but it was the beginnings. And I, I came away feeling that, you know, that Europe was sort of the canary, and particularly Barcelona, kind of the canary in the coal mine for what we were just beginning to see in some cities in the US. And so there was a lot that the US and, and other parts of the world could really learn from, from Europe in terms of what they were going through and, and how they were trying to address it. There are, as Kelsey said, there are a lot in the book. Um, there's seven chapters, and I'm going to put on my glasses because I don't want to misquote anything, but um, I'm just going to touch on a few. Uh, there's Galapagos Islands. There's the Big Sur in California. There's um, Galapagos Islands for those who are in Ecuador. There's Hawaii. There is Iceland, there's Lake Tahoe, there's Colorado, there's New Zealand, 
um, starts out with in the beginning, and I, I, I mentioned this just a moment ago that, you know, I, I come not only from well-traveled as a global citizen, but from a family who um, respects and looks at nature and culture and environment in a different way. And in the beginning, you kind of touch upon one of the Kennedys going on Hatch River expedition, <laughs> and that set off kind of a a movement for river running and uh, not just the Colorado River, the Grand Canyon and, and Hatch uh, River Expeditions. And I actually worked uh, for Hatch River Expeditions as a river guide when I was younger. But before that, I, I actually went on several trips. I did the, the, uh, the, the Salmon River and, and a sport yak with Hatch, Hatch Expeditions. And so I have very fond memories in it. And back then it was a, a kind of a rare occasion. But over the years, we just continuously see these tourist spots. You guys also talk about Peru and you talk about Brazil. And you talk about so many case studies. And at the end of each of these sections and chapters on the case studies, there's a plethora of links and other references and places you can go and with a nice conclusion about what's being done and, and what are some of the solutions and what you guys are working towards or what, what um, some potentials are. So there's, there's a lot of things that kind of just sparked me to light up, but also where I said, okay, how, how does this look in, in, in my own life? Because you know, especially after this pandemic, I haven't traveled at all, at all um, uh, during this entire time, which is highly unusual. I've made a big shift in, in how I do it. Um, but I also feel a little bit of an itch to, to meet people live and give them a hug and, and to see different cultures. I have friends and family all over the world and my family in the United States and, and, and Asia. I haven't been able to see because of this lockdown and just out of their consideration. And so there are so many facets of what you guys have discussed in this whole big picture. So there's emotions, there's culture, there's this way that we were raised or were way that we weren't raised and um, people uh, specifically in the Dach region, the Germany, Austria and Switzerland area, um, who speak German are really hyper focused on their vacations. The government pays for a certain amount of time of vacation. And for us to start to say, hey, you need to do it differently. You need to think about it differently. It could touch nerve, right? And so I, I, I really want to see how uh, or have you explain not only um, how you touch in what you do and as and as well in the book that nerve of population and, and i and i want to refer or, or that nerve of culture of different people who are like well you can't tell me i can't travel or i can't do this or how how do i do it or how do we get them to to go think in a different way when they go someplace and the the reason i bring that up is like i mentioned i i, I traveled a, a lot my father and my mother always taught me, leave the campsite or the place better than you found it. Pack out what you pack in and usually pack out more than you packed in. And that's kind of how I was raised with that. And it's kind of a golden rule. Treat people and planet how you would like to be treated. Um, but not all of us have that. And so I kind of want to know how do you deal with that in the book and how, and how do you deal with it just in your general workings with Crest and and if you could address that, and then we'll get into more serious climate things in, in, a, in a moment. Wow. Um, Kelsey? <laughs> yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, um, you, you were saying about how, how do we get people to realize that they need to treat these places with much more respect? Um, and I think it ties into kind of what I was saying earlier about what I realized coming out of the pandemic. Um, and to me, one of the things I realized is that travel is not a right. 
it's, it's very much a privilege. And a lot of people don't have the freedom of mobility um, that, and you know, during the pandemic, we all, we all realized that uh, we don't have the freedom of mobility that we're used to having on a day-to-day -day basis. And that um, this, what I want people to understand is that the pandemic isn't unique. There are going to be hurricanes and natural disasters and political instability and other things that are going to restrict your right to movement. Um, and I think that when people travel, they first of all need to, to recognize that immense privilege that they have, that they're able to go somewhere um, and, and spend time in that destination. Um, but one of the principles I always like to use is kind of like what you were saying, Mark, when, when you go somewhere, um, uh, leave it better than you left it, but also treat the destination like you're in someone's home. Um, and you truly are. It's not just a place where, where visitors come and lay on the beach and drink in the bars. It's a place where people live, where they work. Um, and I think you can do that by, by learning about the place that you're visiting. Um, one of the first places that I, that I had the privilege of going to um, when it was allowed and I was able to was St. Martin um, in the Caribbean. And I very much enjoyed learning about the really unique history and the culture there. I hadn't really spent that much time in the Caribbean at all. Um, growing up, my family um, didn't do a lot of sun and sand vacations. As I mentioned, we did more historical uh, <laughs> vacations um, where we learned about, about US sites. Um, but so I had this image in my head that, that the Caribbean was a monolith, that all of the islands were the same, and that what you did when you got there was you laid on the beach and that is not the case at all. And every island has a unique story to tell. And I just found that so fascinating. And I think as a traveler, you truly have a better experience when you get that opportunity to learn about the place you're visiting, talk to the people there, understand their way of life and their culture. You know, I think um, a couple of other thoughts. One, I, when, we, when we did our first conference on over tourism, um, we looked at, we, we tried to sort of organize or understand where, which types of destinations were being most impacted by overtourism. And we came up with five different types of destinations which are reflected in the, the organization of the book. And these are, are uh, parks and protected areas, world heritage sites, cities, beaches and coastlines, and then what we called sort of destinations, places like Iceland or New Zealand or um, Lake Tahoe, so on. Um, and, and so we tried to look at, at those. And I remember at the conference, um, we had a speaker from the Canadian and the US Park Service. And they were talking about how with over tourism, they really needed to grapple for the first time with um, limiting numbers of people coming into the parks, which was really anathema to the the sort of democratic spirit behind the parks, which is that they're, you know, this belongs to the people, it's open for everybody, it should be free or as, as, uh, cost, as, as uh, cost free as possible and so on. Um, and, and yet what they said was that when they began to put in reservation systems into some of the parks that were really experiencing over tourism, they were worried that people would resist it. And what they found was just the opposite that actually people appreciated the fact that when they, if they made a reservation ahead of time, when they got to the park, they knew it would not be overcrowded. They knew that, there would, that they would enjoy their time there. And so what had become a kind of obstacle and um, a, a sort of a, a beginning of, of rules and regulations within tourism that hadn't been there before actually became a plus and was increasing the, 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 the tourism experience for the travelers. And I think we also have seen that in some of the cities in, that, that have been overcrowded, that kind of the, the among the front lines in, in terms of raising questions about it have been tour operators, because they're hearing from their visitors, from their guests, from their clients, people traveling with them, that they don't like being in Barcelona where there's a zillion people or in Venice or in whatever you know, any of the other cities, and that they want to either go somewhere else or they want to travel in an off season, they want some solutions. And so I think that this has been, you know, sort of a positive thing that has come out of 
um, the the over tourism that it's not just telling tourists no you can't do this but it's actually the solutions can value of enhance the value of the tourism experience if they're done well because they because people will not be overcrowded because they'll go to a little you know a place that is not so familiar but has great attractions and so on so there there are ways to do um to do the regulations that we need around over tourism in ways that are a benefit to the tourist as well as to the industry to the planet to the to the local residents and so on Thank you so much for, for clarifying that and adding that extra. The, the book goes into not, not just so many case studies uh, around the world. It's very diverse um, and it addresses really all aspects and then kind of uh, wraps up at the end with a little bit of help and solutions, some, some best practices and, and like you said it's split up into those five uh sections which is so important um i i want to kind of with that uh, set up a little bit to go a little bit deeper because climate change really has a strong strong impact on tourism but on biodiversity and life on our planet period moving forward and um there's, there's some issues that happen. And one of those five that you mentioned are beach, beaches and coastlines. And for um, beaches and coastlines, they're the number one first hit by climate change. Beaches and coastal areas are the number one hit. Um, number one is Philippines, uh, many islands, thousand plus islands, maybe even more than that, 3000 plus islands, something like that, innumerable number. Of, uh, of islands, they were hit by Hurricane Hyen and Yolanda, uh, 20,000 plus people were killed and billions of dollars of damage. Um, and, and there's many other coastal beach regions around the world that are, are beautiful um, and, um, that are really hit hard because of the global warming that we have going on. And um, in crests, kind of vision or mission that I read that that they talk about the triple bottom line. Um, I, I just wanted to to kind of mention something and, and I want to add on to that um, thinking and see what your thoughts and ideas are. I don't know if you know about the triple bottom line, but it's not only people, planet and profits, but it's um, economy environment and society which are, which are the same things just formulated different was actually come up with a, from a man about 27 years ago john elkington and this is his last book it's green swans he came up with the bottom line 27 triple bottom line 27 years ago but um and before that time we were really working on the single bottom line and the double bottom line which is antiquated it goes clear back to leonardo da vinci out of a uh, uh, franciscan friar mathematician out of italy um, who who came up with the single and double bottom line which is history and culture for that that we've been operating up uh, on pretty much until 27 years ago but what happened is in 2018 John Elkington said that this triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit, was being used in the wrong way, and that people were uh, people and businesses and organizations were using that as an accounting principle. And he did the first ever sustainable recall in, in 2018. He recalled it. He pulled it back, and he said, "We're not doing the triple bottom line. I've never done this before, but we need to pull it back." And it was shortly after he was working on a project called uh, Pro a Project Breakthrough with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, with a bunch of businesses. And he realized, I, I want them to use the triple bottom line, but they're only using the profit part as an accountability measurement tool. And they're leaving society, people, and the economy uh, or in the environment out of it. And they're only focusing in on the economy and the profit aspect. And so um, 
the general trend is what they call regenerative capitalism or regenerative economies that we're really doing these local economies and we're, we're including the people on these coastal lines. So I appreciate you giving my setup for, for um, the, these other cases that you have in, in the book and how the triple bottom line and climate change comes into that. It's almost a twin threat. And I want you to explain to me why is it a twin threat and what does it mean? And how are you going beyond the triple bottom line to really help these areas or how are they emerging with new solutions moving forward with this exponential climate change that we're seeing all around the world? Mm -hmm. Well, I think as you, as you rightly pointed out, Mark, um, where we have seen the, the collision or the convergence of over tourism and climate change most acutely are in coastlines and beaches. And you know, this, this is really presenting a lot of problems. I mean, one is that much of the um, tourism that takes place on, coach, on, on, on coastlines in the, in the uh, shoreline off, of, off the coast and so on, is um, it's very difficult to move this. I mean, the cruise industry, for instance, needs to be at sea and they need to have their docks built right along the, the, the seafront. Uh, people going to the Caribbean or, or elsewhere to the Philippines and so on are used to, are expecting to vacation right on the beaches to have their, their infrastructure, their hotels and so on. So it, it requ requires a change in mindset and a change in a lot of infrastructure and probably laying aside some parts of the tourism industry that just cannot be done with the, uh, with, with, with the onslaught of climate change, which um, for, for beaches and coastlines is you know, killing the, the coral reefs and the, and the um, sea grasses and so on, and uh, causing sea level rise, increased storms, increasingly fierce and frequent storms and so on, that just makes living on the coastlines difficult. So that's one huge set of problems that it is very difficult to find an alternative kind of tourism for what we are seeing where we're having come together, you know, masses of people wanting to, I mean, most people want a vacation. It's the most popular place to vacation on a coastline or a beach. Um, and plus the, the increasing assault from climate change. The other part of that, I think, is that oftentimes beaches are the least well managed. I mean, what we found in our book in looking at the different types of destinations, national parks, for instance, actually have a long history of rather good management. And so they have been able to cope with, with over tourism and with climate change, with other kinds of, and the pandemic and so on, um, in an organized way. Cities oftentimes, are, are quite well structured to, to, to come up with solutions and so on. Beaches oftentimes fall into a kind of, it's not quite clear who is jurisdiction. It may be a light hand of jurisdiction over it and so on. And so it is much more difficult to come up with workable solutions uh, that need to be directed by some entity, the, um, either government or, or an international agency or something to, to enforce, to put in, 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 in place the, the changes that need to take place. And so you've got these twin, you've got on coastlines and beaches, one, this is the fastest growing part of the tourism industry. The most popular destinations are on beaches and coastlines. And you've got this convergence of, of, of uh, climate change and over tourism, um, very difficult to redo the kind of tourism that could take place on, in, the, in these areas. And administratively, it's management wise, it's very difficult, oftentimes very difficult to see who's in charge. So I think these, this of all the places that we looked at, this is where I see the, uh, the least progress so far and, and um, the most challenges for coming up with solutions. Do you have anything to say on that, Kelsey? Yeah, um, I, I love that you brought up the triple bottom line uh, topic because Crest recently 
stop saying people, planet, and profit for similar reasons. Um, and we started saying people, planet, and prosperity. Um, to us as a, as a nonprofit, uh, the word profit doesn't really uh, mean what, uh, it doesn't mean economic benefit for destinations in the places that we're working. Um, it sort of implies, you know, maybe a hotel doing really well or something like that. Um, and what we wanted to convey is that it's about more than just profit, it's about destinations really um, prospering and that money going towards um, communities that, that need it. So a good example is in the Caribbean, um, a lot of um, islands aren't getting the economic benefit from cruise tourism that they should. Um, especially when in port cities, a lot of the stores are owned by the cruise lines. A lot of the tours that cruise passengers can book when they come into a port, um, some of that money goes back to the cruise lines as well. Um, so when you think about it, if you're a cruise passenger and you get off in a destination and you spend eight hours and you, know, you spend a few dollars here and there, a lot of that money isn't going to the destination at all. It's going back to the cruise line. Um, and we call that economic leakage. Um, so if you really want a destination to prosper, you have to think about um, the entire system of, of where your dollars are going so that it's not just about profit, but it's about, like I said, prosperity. I love that. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm that's glad great. you, I love that you clarified that. And that is, yeah. it is truly about prosperity. It's about livability. It's about prosperity. It's about looking forward and, um, the, the book is definitely not academic. It's definitely not doom and gloom. It's really uh, a well written, beautiful, beautiful case studies that uh, enlighten uh, many different areas. Um, the last thing I have to say about you know the the one of the five aspects be beaches and coastlines is they're uh, also on the podcast. Had uh, Carolyn Kloski and Billy Fleming um, on the podcast. They wrote for Island Press the book called A Blueprint for Co Coastal Adaptation. Uh, uh, Island Press just amazes me. They constantly have the best authors and the best topics thinking about our world and how we can help to really fix some of these environmental and, and, and problems that we have that are human cause, man made cause. And so, what the last harp that I kind of have to get on and, and, and I don't know if we'll go down a rabbit hole, but I want to bring it up. During the, during the pandemic cruise ships, there's, there's not enough docks for all the cruise ships to dock. So what happened is after they dropped off their, their passengers, they've continued to cruise around with just a skeleton crew, their ships, because there's no place to dock until they can start up their cruises again. That's one aspect of that uh, I'll, I'll let the listeners decide if that's something sustainable or, or uh, would make sense. And, and then the second thing is uh, we hear a lot about fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions but usually the fishing and cruise and tourism shipping industry is left um, on the side. There's not a lot of talk about the immense um, emissions that, that the ships uh, leave, but also the immense amount of uh, food waste and different things that occur um, on the ship but also when, once they hit port or, or how that type of travel or that experiential type of tourism is. And, and I, I would just like to, to kind of hear, is that something that's taking a shift towards more sustainable practices, better ships, less pollution, um, things that you see coming down the line or, or are there, um, are there some sanctions or anything that we can kind of hope of in those areas? And, and I know some people will be upset. That's they, they love to go on cruises, 
but really, uh, unless I'm wrong, uh, it's one of the most unsustainable ways to, to, to travel and to tour the world um, that's out there. Yeah, you know, I think Crest has done um, quite a bit of work on cruise tourism over the years. And our, our sort of central focus has been on what are the pros and cons of cruise tourism for the ports of call. So we've really looked at the island states in the Caribbean countries in Central America, and now we're involved in a project that's looking at the the uh, at looking at Alaska and the network of ports that feed into the Alaska tourism. And our question has been um, how to compare cruise tourism to the other options that are out there to what is called in the Caribbean stayover tourism, people who fly to the islands and spend their vacation on as, as uh, Kelsey did uh, St. Martin's or some other place in, in the Caribbean. And what are, what are the trade-offs? What, what, how much money is going into the local economy from both types of tourism? We're doing the same thing now in Alaska, looking at cruise tourism, large scale cruise tourism compared with what's called in Alaska independent travel. And that includes a whole collection of different kinds of travel from small scale cruises and yachts to people who are, in some cases drive to Alaska. You can drive to parts of it, um, to people who fly in, to people who um, come in on rails, on trains, and, um, and basically plan their own trip or on smaller cruises where the trips are planned. And we're looking at the comparison. And what we have found where we've done most of our work in the Caribbean is that cruise tourism puts far less into the economy. For instance, in the Caribbean in 2015, there were about the same number of people going to the Caribbean on a cruise and as stayover passengers flying to an island and spending vacation there. Same number of people, it was about 25,000 in each category, 25 million, excuse me, in each category going um, to, the Car to the Caribbean, one of 32 islands in the Caribbean. Um, and yet what we found is that the cruise industry, that the overall tourism was, um, let me just check the amount. I think it was, um, sorry, I hope you can cut out some of this, but let me just get the amount. Um, Funny, but anyway, what we found was that in the Caribbean, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but it was something like six billion dollars that was raised through tourism. Of that, 0.8 billion came from cruise tourism, and 5.2 billion came from uh, stayover tourism, people who flew to the Caribbean. So overwhelmingly, the the money that port that that destinations in the Caribbean were gaining from tourism came from stayover tourism, not from cruise tourism, even though they were both sending the same number of tourists to the Caribbean. Um, we're, we'll see what we find in Alaska, but it's undoubtedly going to be something along the same lines that independent travel leaves much more in the local economy than does cruise tourism. So from our point of view, the, yes, the environmental issues are, are enormous in terms of cruise ships and cruise ships themselves are getting bigger and bigger all the time. So those issues are in some ways becoming greater. But I also do feel there's been some efforts to um, deal with some of the most egregious um, problems with cruise tourism in terms of the smokestacks, the polluting the smokestacks, trying to have sh more ships that are plug-ins when they get into ports. Um, and uh, trying to deal with some of the waste issues and so on. In a way, these problems, they, technological solutions could be found. What I worry about is these ships that are just so big and they're basically unloading so many people at a time in small, either fragile islands or fragile cities and so on, that it's just too big to cope with. And there isn't really a solution. We need to get, as, as Kelsey said, smaller, slower, you know, less frenetic and so on. We need a different kind of travel, which, which really the small cruise lines offer, frankly. But we, it, it's just hard to imagine how we can continue with ever-increasing ports, ever-increasing size of ships, ever-increasing numbers of passengers, and 
be on a path towards sustainability. We're not. I really appreciate you addressing it in that way. And I don't, uh, we won't hold your feet to the fire with those numbers. This is just the discussion between us and we'll say, oh, you were off on the numbers, Martha. That's, uh, uh, we know that you guys have done your research, you presented the cases and it's, uh, the data is good to a certain point, but it's really not about the numbers. It's about really the results and it's about where is the trend going? Is it getting better or is it getting worse? Mm -hmm. And um, this leads me to another, and this is almost a question and I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to formulate it right. So in the book, you talk about the UNESCO World Heritage Sites as well. And just for our listeners, so, you know, UNESCO World Heritage really has great purposes and is, 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 is great in its own right. There's currently, to date, uh, as of today, 1,120 properties that are on the World uh, Heritage Site. There's uh, 51 of them that are in danger and 868 that are cultural. Um, uh, 213 that are natural uh, sites, and then about 39 mixed sites where they're mixed between cultural, endangered, or, or uh, um, natural sites. And uh, 167 different countries or state parties are involved in, in those all, all those uh, 1,120. And, and, and that, that's where I'm throwing out the numbers, but that, that are accurate. But I want to go a little bit deeper. In some respects, there's a lot of you know wisdom and, and great benefits to belong to that. But I see a flip side that it could maybe be a bad thing to be on the World Heritage Site. To maybe that that also puts a flag up that that's where everybody's got to go and see and 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 that then in and of itself brings a lot of problems along with it. And so. I, you guys are the experts, and I kind of want to get both sides of the coin, and, and uh, maybe you could tell us where that's going, what the positives are, and if there are if there are any, and um, how that that goes. And then just for my listeners as well, uh, you know, after after this podcast or in their own uh, uh, musings, please go to the world uh, UNESCO's World Heritage sites. It's a treasure trove of information, not only maths and data and, and books and free books and, and paid books that kind of get you up to speed on why, where, and what. And when you guys answer this question afterwards, that's when I really want us to go a little bit deeper in culture and history, which Kelsey brought up kind of, that's why you as an individual started to travel and how that ties into things. But I want to let you answer this World Heritage, and please feel free, whoever wants to go first. Um, well, why don't I start and then Kelsey, please come in. So in a way, I think I've come to view the World Heritage sites as kind of the world's equivalent to our national parks, that it is taking the, you know, the most iconic, they, they have to be places that have world-class um, features that the world will be less um, rich without. And so they, they are naming the cultural sites and the natural sites that just like the Galapagos Islands or the Serengeti or um, so on, uh, that, that if we lose them, we've really lost part of our, you know, of our, of our richness of, of this planet. Um, so it's a very positive, I think it's very positive that the world community came together um, and said, we're going to protect these places. The problem is that we've never put, the, U, the United Nations has never put enough resources behind them to properly protect them. And many of these places are located in very poor countries. And as you, as you mentioned, Mark, this simple designation of a site as a World Heritage Site begins to attract tourism. And the reality is that most of these places have become dependent on tourism for their funding mechanism because they're not getting it internationally 
and they're not getting it from the local government. So they've turned to tourism. And as we've seen in many places, oftentimes they've developed a model of attracting more and more tourists, of trying to attract more and more tourists and so on, and of not having a really strong management system in place so that they frequently are not being properly managed. We see this in Venice, for instance, um, which is because uh, um, of cruise tourism and too many day visitors, too many Airbnbs, et cetera, et cetera, is suffering from over tourism and is, is on what is called the World Heritage um, uh, sites in danger list, the in danger list. And this, this is an important instrument that UNESCO has to highlight when there is a real problem with a World Heritage Site. And it's not, and that it that basically the World Heritage Site can be taken off the list if it if it does if it fails to maintain proper standards. The UNESCO is reluctant to take things, take, take sites off of, off, off of the, the um, World Heritage Site designation and local and, and countries do not want to have their, their iconic places removed from the UNESCO list. So this happens with great care and reluctance and so on. That doesn't happen very often. But the two main problems, I think, um, having worked on that chapter on the, on the World Heritage Sites are a lack oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes a lack of proper management of the site and a lack of proper of sufficient resources to manage it. Yeah, and I can hop in and, and illustrate that with an example. Um, one of our chapters was on Mount Everest. So obviously an incredibly mm -hmm. iconic, you know, world-class uh, site. And as Martha is saying, the UNESCO designation comes with a lot of um, marketing potential, frankly. Um, it, it comes with a lot of visibility. And when there aren't resources put behind um, that visibility, it becomes a huge issue. So, and I don't know if you saw the pictures of this um, from a few years back, um, but when we look at, of, at pictures of, of people climbing Mount Everest these days, it's lines of climbers all crammed into one tiny little space, trying to get to the top, get that photo um, and, and head back down. And it's not the experience that, that you would think of when you think of Everest as this world-class site and destination. Um, you couple that with, as we called the, the twin threat of, of climate change and over tourism on Mount Everest, um, a lot of the, um, the ice is melting away some of the human bodies that have been left there are, are becoming revealed. Um, a lot of trash is being left behind by the, the climbers because of logistical issues with bringing it back down. Um, it creates a lot of safety issues as well. There's, um, because of the weather of, of Mount Everest and getting up safely, there's a very limited period in which you can actually ascend in a safe manner. So everyone ends up doing it on the same day. Um, another issue is that there's been a proliferation of um, lower cost operators that are helping people get to the top who perhaps don't have the experience that they should um, and they're a lot cheaper so people that maybe shouldn't be climbing the mountain um, would have access um, and that creates a lot of safety issues as well um, and the management comes down to um, uh, Nepal and China who are on either sides of Mount Everest um, and frankly there's there's a lot of gaps a lot of mismanagement um, not a very well-structured uh, permitting system. Um, so I think UNESCO does have a responsibility to, to um, work with those destination managers, with those countries, with the people who manage those sites. Um, they also have, have national park units around Everest um, and come up with a better management system. I really appreciate that and, and uh, I love that example and it, it's true so I also like to climb and I, I have a wonderful partner who climbs all you know Mont Blanc and, and uh, Tanzania and uh, many many um, Kilimanjaro and, and many other mountains out there Mutters Alm and so it's uh, I, I know and I've heard and seen some of those things as well uh, and that's just one example. That's a high probably where there's a, a small percentage of people um, who are 
explorers and adventurers that would would go there and maybe it's becoming more attractive but there are thousands of other such locations that are also world heritage that have been increased in that today until the 31st of July is actually the 44th session so we're recording this in, in uh the 23rd of July but the recording will be released much later but actually while we're doing this recording is the 44th session of the World Heritage Committee and it's actually in China it's a fuzu but it's an online meeting and I think there's some it's a little hybrid but it, it started on the 16th of July and goes clear to the 31st where they're not only focusing in on China but also on the rest of the world and hopefully addressing some of these other issues uh that we brought up and and i think it's it's really important that that we touched upon that because uh, as many things in our world it starts out with good intentions and wants to help and then it quickly goes awry and and, and we see the consequences of this and you know we finished up the cruise ships, but there was a, a thing that came up twice for both of you is that for the growth in cruise ships or even to maintain the cruise ships that are currently operating, there has to be an infrastructure put in place, not just in ports where they can dock, but also in once they dock that the infrastructure of those World Heritage or beach sites or coastal areas where they're docking then can support the almost exponential number of people that just pile off of those ships in, in one, one moment and, and overload uh, some very struggling economies, cultures, communities when it is. And that's not just a problem in the cruise industry, that's a problem for our entire world, our, and especially for World Heritage Sites. The infrastructure is already lacking. It's already behind in many respects. The roads, I mean, Rome's a, a prime example. Uh, if you go to Rome, I go there all the time for the FAO. Uh, wonderful world heritage things there, wonderful coliseums and things. But the infrastructure is sorely lacking to maintain current population and current tourism let alone that's what's projected to go and uh, forward in the future. And so the reason I bring that up is uh, I, I deal a lot with innovations and infrastructures and cities and, and obviously I'm a sustainable development goal advocate, which means sustainable development. How do we develop so that we can be around for future generations in the future? And, and most people don't understand that's infrastructure. How do we keep that infrastructure growing and expanding to sustain those people who are going to visit or there? And there are some new tools, geospatial tools, but also other modeling tools available to project whether those infrastructures can handle high flow, high traffic, high population, high tourism and things. Do you see more of those things, uh, solutions or more of those things coming about that are helping and supporting communities and cities that are struck with these problems that, that are in the line? And, uh, and this is also a, a good part to kind of tickle some of the end of the book where you guys present some solutions as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um... And that issue is why we had a whole chapter on historic cities in our book, um, because the issue that you have is that um, there's a lot of outdated, a lot of historic infrastructure that isn't um, prepared to handle the sheer numbers of people that are coming into a city. And when you talk about um, innovations and, and geospatial awareness, the first thing I think of um, in terms of solutions is Barcelona. Um, so the contributor for that chapter talked a lot about, um, first of all, just destination master planning, which is a really important tool when you're looking at a city or a destination um, that's dealing with over tourism, because as you said before, tourism is so multi-sectoral, it's transportation, it's environment, it's energy. Um, and in order to deal with all of those issue issues, you need to look at it holistically. Um, so Barcelona came up with a really effective master plan for the destination. 
And one of the key components was um, that spatial planning, that awareness, um, you know, coming up with um, better plans for city streets and sidewalks, um, making sure that tourists were um, distributed more evenly. So actually controlling where they're going and what they're doing. Um, so I think that's a really interesting case study to look at um, in terms of uh, that type of planning. I think we've seen also coming out of the pandemic um, some some solutions that are, are very, very important for over tourism. For instance, Hawaii uh, during the pandemic, they, where tourism is their most important industry, of course, and they did a survey of Hawaiians to say how do they feel about returning to tourism as they had known it before the pandemic, and to the surprise of the tourism authority people overwhelmingly said no, that they didn't want to a return to, the, to the, the tourism that they had known before the pandemic. They wanted revisions. And basically they wanted what one of the, the crucial issues in Hawaii has been um, illegal Airbnbs that have cropped up and have really eroded um, and uh, made, you know, very, unattractive a lot of communities and, and neighborhoods particularly beach communities and so on and uh, and these are advertised on websites and so on but they're not legally registered they're not permitted and so on and so that was one big issue so what hawaii came up with rather than just you know sort of walking away from this crisis was that they now are doing it as kelsey was mentioning master plans for each island that are focused on management and not marketing. I mean, they're not ignoring marketing, but they're not putting the focus on marketing, which has again and again and again meant increasing the number of tourists. That's the objective of marketing. Rather, it is to talk about how to manage well tourism and to basically earn more per tourist. Um, rather than increase the numbers, let's increase the earning per, per tourist by having people stay longer, by having um, by doing away with some of the, the illegal Airbnbs that where money is just not staying in the local economy and so on. So uh, they're in a process of doing that. And that's really a, a combination of over tourism that they were experiencing before the pandemic and then seeing the during the pandemic, what a return to what life could be like without cruise ships, without Airbnb, without, uh, you know, a mass, I mean, they don't have too many cruise tourists. I, I'm sorry that misspoke, but but without the hordes of tourists that, who they had seen coming to, to Hawaii and people basically were able to drive without a lot of traffic, were able to go to the beaches without huge crowds and so on. And they liked it. And they want to see if they can create a, a kind of tourism that protects the sorts of quality of life that they, that they were losing. So I think we, you know, we are seeing some really positive developments potentially that we still, it's gonna be a struggle. I mean, the big players in tourism are going to be fighting to come back bigger, better, or maybe not better, but bigger than ever, you know, and just get back into business. Um, and, uh, but communities, a lot of communities are saying, no, this is not what we want. So I think that the, you know, the verdict is the ultimate, what will ultimately happen is still not known. But I think we've got you know, more of a fighting chance than when we were going into the pandemic, that people now are really considering the importance of, of base, most fundamentally sustainability, that they've got to you know, protect their way of life by doing tourism in ways that, is, that are sustainable. The book is really a treasure trove and uh, has a nice summation in the end and gives wonderful case studies. I want to, we're not done yet, so don't, don't, don't go yet. I, I, it, I, what, what I'm saying is we could really talk for hours to um, even start to scratch the surface on what this book brings to light, what it covers, with the, some of the issues we're seeing. Um, one of them Kelsey brought up in the beginning is <clears throat> through the pandemic, travel and tourism will never be the same again. So right now, 
Germans and Europeans are still not in the uh, Schlangen, I think, uh, group are still not allowed to travel into the U.S. because of COVID restrictions. So that's one thing. The other, the other thing is this global citizenry. We have a lot of nationalism, a lot of people, borders, walls, checkpoints that um, are, are there where it's just not easy. And it's kind of a privilege to, 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 to travel or to go anyway in, in a normal world, but one of pandemics and mutations, it's even harder. Um, I, I hope we can have another time to talk at a different time uh, a little bit more of how you see tourism and travel industry going with maybe global citizenship or global passports or new digital mm -hmm. forms that allow access to people uh, to travel all around the world. And then secondly, how that maybe is something that might not happen or is unrealistic. But there's a flip side to that because of climate change, we're actually seeing a climate migrants forcing movement to different places and a lot of things happening. And, and it's not just um, underdeveloped countries or those who are struggling. Germany was just hit uh, and is still suffering greatly um, because of the floods, which is all mm -hmm. climate. And believe it or not, some very wealthy and, and developed people here in Germany are now displaced because they don't have a home anymore. They don't have their belongings of their life. And um, hopefully they won't leave Germany, but they're being displaced as a refugee and, and understand how, how it can be to move. And so those are some of the things that we also need to deal with with tourism and and migrations, whether it's a conflict or it's a climate migration or movement. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think, you know, if you want to touch on it quickly, that's that's fine. But that's that's a big thing that we need to talk about that falls into this whole picture of over tourism, tourism, and, and also this this global view of, of the world. Mm -hmm. Ooh, you raised a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, yes, the, the, the global citizen, I, I mean, I think that one of the things that we have learned is that when you travel, especially if you travel in a way that um, doesn't just take you to an enclave, like an all-inclusive beach resort or whatever, but actually gets you out meeting other people, that this is a profound form of education. And that it sort of is stimulating parts of our brains that are not quite stimulated by classroom learning. That it's a different kind of learning that, and, and you know, experiential is the term most often used. And in a way it can be more profound than um, book learning because your all of your senses are involved and you know, your hands, your, your smell, your taste, your sight and so on. Um, and, and so building global citizenship through travel is, a, is an extremely important reason for keeping the travel industry going. Um, and it was, you know, what was threatened by the pandemic, certainly. Uh, but I think that, that, you know, we're convinced that we, we need this as human beings, we need this. And as societies, we need this kind of interaction that it, that it educates us in profound ways that build better people and better societies. Um, so that, that that is extremely important. The flip side of that, as you also mentioned, is that we are increasingly going to see people being forced to move, not choosing to travel, but forced to flee, either because of, of poverty and economic reasons or because of political turmoils or because of wildfires and, and floods and so on. Um, and that we're going to we're going to see massive movements of people, and we we have not figured out at all how to deal with that. I mean, we're just I I I personally feel at the moment we're just battered day after day with more catastrophes that we have no idea that the wildfires in Oregon that they're saying you know just have to burn until someday it'll rain. 
and you know the floods that you were talking about in in Germany and so on. I mean, on and on, and and the the turmoil, the the squeeze that we are seeing through climate change and, and other factors that are forcing people out of Latin America, out of Africa, into Europe, into the U.S. and so on, and this these destabilizing effects of desperate people, and we we don't know how to deal with that. We and I I don't have an answer for that, but but I think you know there's positive necessary things about travel but the the reality is that we are going to see people on the move in ways that we have not you know fully anticipated and we just don't know how to deal with in an organized fashion i take this bigger look that uh we're all homo sapiens on this uh, crew crew members on this big spaceship earth and that um Really, we're all global citizens. We're all the same species. And uh, even though we, we've uh, fallen into structures of division and nationalism, I um, believe that there are some other tools. And again, we won't be able to go into it too much, but I really wanted to tickle upon it. Um, I, I, I'd like to maybe hear your opinions or your thoughts as well. I believe the reason all inclusive resorts are big, that cruise ships are big, that um, these package tourisms uh, or package deals for, for travel are good is because they're convenient. They take care of everything. It's all inclusive. It's a complete thing. Put your luggage on the ship and it stays there the whole time while you're exploring the world and seeing the seas and we feed you 24 seven and it's, it's this, this life of the royalty. Um, on the flip side with that same convenience type of thinking, if eco villages, eco tourism, sustainable ways um, were to kind of offer those same services, like the minute you, you get to the airport, you don't have to worry that your flight is carbon offset naturally that that uh, the travel from the airport to your resort or to the place where you're staying, whether it's a hostel or a hotel or motel or a resort, that that's taken care of. And um, as I was mentioning in the very beginning, I said, Asia, I've seen some great examples. One of the very first world's hotels to have this ISO 2000 uh, 20,121 certification is the Plaza Atani Bangkok, which is basically not only enveloping the sustainable development goals, but every kind of event or anything around their hotel is not only carbon offset, recycled, composted, different types of methods and standards. And when I go to travel for events, I also say is does this event do carbon offsetting? Do you have certification and standards? Are there things in place? And then if we take it even a step further, so not only is there uh, a big trend in carbon offsetting, carbon capturing with resorts and locations, but now there's these eco villages and eco tourism and, and um, there's this new one at, with the United Nation that's called the Decade of Restoration now above and beyond uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. And they have these ecosystem restoration camps and it's, it's like going on vacation, except you get to work to restore nature. And a lot of people are seeing those as an experiential, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, um, Martha, that really are an ex experiential way that you're saying, wow, I just spent time restoring nature and uh, camped out under in nature under the stars and had a great time doing it, that there's a real push in that. Well, what if, what if instead of, or, or we use the same tricks and methods as cruise ships and all-inclusive resorts who maybe are damaging the culture or the community or the environment, mm -hmm. And we do that on the flip side. And not only does it do the triple bottom line, it goes beyond that because now they're covering and making sure that the, the, the thing that you so wor work so hard to do is convenient for you to do, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, uh, Kelsey. Yeah, like I mean, I'll just say, yeah. I'll just say that um, that's what we advocate advocate for every day is that the principles of responsible travel and ecotourism are not just siloed into certain types of travel. So only people that want to um, plant trees while they travel or or protect nature or go to eco villages like you were talking about, but that the principles are woven throughout all types of travel and specifically mass tourism. Um, and in my mind, it, it would provide a better experience for um, travelers that are used to that all-inclusive experience. They're used to that convenience. Martha, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that we are really convinced about, having worked in this, this field for a long time, is that um, what we're promoting, sustainable travel, responsible travel, is actually superior for the traveler. It's not just the right thing for the planet or the right thing for the local community or whatever, or the environment, but it, but it, is, it actually provides a superior vacation. So we're selling a better product. And, um, and so we, we don't need to apologize for trying to get people to do the right thing. The done properly, done well, um, it is, it's a superior kind of vacation. And I just have seen this both personally and taking my family, taking friends on trips or sending them on trips. And people have again and again and again come back and said, wow, that was the best vacation I've ever been on. Because they really engaged with people, because they learned something, but learned it, you know, not because they had to read and sit in a the classroom. They felt, you know, as we talked about, they felt it and they experienced it and so on. Um, that other kind of learning that, that we were actually really relished and so on. So, so we're selling a good product. And I think that's, that's the starting point. But I think the other reality is that yes, cruises and all inclusives are attractive because they're easy. They're also attractive because they appear to be cheaper. And this is a huge selling point. And I think there are a couple of things to say about that. One is that oftentimes they're actually, if you add up all that you've spent, they're not cheaper. That there are lots of hidden costs on a cruise, for instance, increasingly, you may have to pay for drinks. There are all sorts of enticements, auctions and so on to, to try to get you to spend more money. Um, of course, all of the onshore um, excursions and so on are extra. So that oftentimes people, and we've done this, we've done surveys with passengers and compared what they actually spent getting on a, a cruise to, for instance, Belize, compared with what a typical week stay in Belize costs. And the week stay, including airfare, was cheaper than a, a cruise. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but it, it certainly happens a, a number of times, um, you know, much of the time. So I think that that's, that that's one thing um, that, you know, that, that cost may be a little bit ephemeral, but it is an attraction to the all-inclusives and, and, the, um, and the cruises. And we need to begin to call out what the real, real costs are. So, um, and, and the, uh, but the other point that I want to make, and this is something that, um, we grapple with all the time is that we want to try to keep travel accessible, e egalitarian. Um, we want to be able to make it that it's not just, I mean, an easy way to control crowds or try to control crowds and so on, deal with over tourism is just to raise the price, to make it so expensive that only a handful of people can afford to go. That is not a viable, that's not an equitable answer. People need to be able to travel. And I think our national parks are sort of the best example of places that have had wide access, and widely accessible to people because they're, they're not expensive to go to. And we need to be building into our solutions, solutions that encompass ability to travel to places that are not expensive. Now you may limit the number of people who can go and you can limit the number through a lottery system or whatever, you don't have to do it by raising the price so that you cut out people who don't have the means, but you do it through a lottery system of pre-registration and so on so that it remains equitable, um, but you are controlling the numbers. So th these are 
this is an area that we've spent a lot of time thinking about. And I think it, you know, it, it needs to be front and center in the solutions to over-tourism is how to do over-tourism in ways that are equitable. How to control uh, tourism. Add to that question. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, just to, just to add to that question of cost, something that I think about a lot is, yes, it's, it's nice to, to go on a vacation for cheap, um, but if you really think about where your money is going and, and who it's supporting, to me personally, I think it's important to, to spend a little bit more so that you are supporting fair wages for um, the, the restaurant workers, the hotel employees, the crafts people. Um, so think about that the next time, you know, that you're, you're trying to purchase a locally made craft um, and your instinct is to haggle for it. Really think about what that, um, that craftsperson put into it the value of their time and what it costs. Um, and I think that um, when, when things are, are developed and sold so cheaply, there's issues at the systems level um, that, that you need to think about. So where were these products made that they can actually be sold so cheaply? Um, how are they treating their workers um, since you know this, this entire vacation is, is so cheap? Um, I think there's real questions there to be asked. I, I totally agree, and I'm glad that you uh, toned that again and spoke to that because it's uh, it's really it's really so important. I, I say this in many different areas, but it holds true to everything in our world that if you cheapen food, you cheapen life. If you cheapen tourism, you cheapen life. If you cheapen work, you cheapen life. I mean. If you cheapen anything, you're cheapening life, you're cutting someone else short, you're exploiting resources. And, and, and the real effect, no matter what we do, we have to pay the true cost accounting, the total cost of, uh, of what it is that we're doing. That's just the realities. And if we don't pay it, there's an environmental cost, there's a health cost, there's a cost somewhere that the environment or human health has to pay in the end effect. I have um, four last questions for you. And I know this has been long. I appreciate you bearing with me, but we really could to go into much depth, a lot more depth. I, I want my listeners to know, even though it sounds like we've covered this book from beginning to end, we haven't, we've only tickled on some of the great wisdoms and the content in it. So I really want you to go out and get it. But the last point that I really need to touch in the book, and it was brought up right in the beginning from you, Kelsey, and it was history. And history ha has a unique um, tie to climate. It has a unique tie to civilization frameworks. It has a unique tie to a lot of things, and that's why I want to bring it up. So today we're in this mode of uh, uh, social media and selfies, and a, a lot of the over-tourism uh, currently with TikTok and some of the new platforms that have emerged, and even Instagram, are really expediting tourism just to get that photo of the Parthenon or... Um, you know, like you said, some people want to get to the top of the Everest, take that photo just to prove that they've been there. And it, it's that way in many respects. Um, I, I want to make absolutely certain uh, that all our listeners and everybody kind of knows, and, and we touched on it a little bit with the World Heritage Site. There are more than 20 world civilizations that have existed before that today no longer exist. Early Aztecs, Incas, Mayas, early Mesopotamia, the Greeks, the Romans, ancient China. There are civilizations that have been here on our planet before that don't exist anymore. And what we find in a lot of the world heritage sites and, and others, that only thing is left is the ruins of those of those places. And so we go to, we should be going to learn the history like Kelsey mentioned, and I, I'm glad to hear that. But a lot of us are going to get that picture 
in front of a ruin or in front of some historical place without totally understanding what they're doing. Um, and what they're doing is they're saying, why did these other very advanced, infrastructurally advanced civilizations that had networks and roads and, and innovations and, and civilizations that were very advanced, why aren't they here anymore? And I'll tell you, all but two of those 20 um, civilizations that aren't here anymore collapse because of ecological or environmental collapse. And all we have left is the ruins today. And the two that didn't collapse because of ecological or environmental uh, collapse because of displacement or conflict is why they collapsed. And so with that type of history in mind, um, and we look good for a selfie for Instagram or TikTok video or however we do it. Um, how are we protecting ourselves from being facing a collapse with climate change moving forward through tourism to get that selfie? And so I, I don't know if that's far reached or if you can agree or you you've seen that push in tourism as well. But I'd like to kind of get that um, edutainment aspect of history and tourism and also how it ties into social media and what you guys see and what true learning lessons should we have when we're taking those selfies and having those experiences to avoid a, a collapse for, for our now civilization. Hmm. Well, I think that one of the things, and this goes back to something that Kelsey was talking about earlier, is that we need we need a new mindset. We need to talk about traveling slower and and longer. Um, and fewer trips, but trips that are for for a longer duration that allow a deeper dive into into a destination, uh, into a culture, into the history of a place, and so on. And this will both lighten up the, the um, press of people in a destination if you have fewer people going there but staying longer. And it will put more resources into the destination. This is the course we should be on. We've got a long ways to go to be able to put in place the, you know, the apparatus that assures this, that this, this can happen. And it means, as we've talked about, that, um, setting limits and having various kinds of caps on how many people in a museum at a time, how many people in a World Heritage Site ruin at a time, and so on, how many people up a mountain at a time, and uh, a reservation system, a lottery system, and so on, to, to allow this to happen in an organized way. I don't see any other way out and this is going back to what you were talking about it's, it's fascinating that you also did the Colorado River early on in your life as a guide and so on and I think that what we learned early on in the 60s from the Colorado River and the fact that Kennedy the Kennedy clan which involved a hundred and some people um, went on a trip and that began to raise the the uh, concerns of too much trash too many people too much too much um, so on how do we control this and the Park Service put in reluctantly, but they began to experiment it only in the Colorado in a kind of control of numbers, which they have had in place since then. And that was like an early experiment with what to do with over tourism that is now being writ large across the, the national park system being used in many, many places. But this, this, is, this is the direction we need to move in. I wanna hit on the question of, um of selfies and Instagram that you brought up. Um, this is one of the huge drivers of over tourism at many destinations. Um, and we touch upon that in our book. And it's, it's actually really sad to me because I think, you know, when you go somewhere, if your motivation is solely just to get a photo and leave, you're really missing out. Um, and in some ways, 
putting yourselves and other in danger. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the destinations we talk about in our book is Trolltunga. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but I'm trying in Norway, um, which is this incredible uh, precipice, this cliff um, that shuts out over a, a beautiful natural area. And um, a lot of the people that are trying to get there are, are motivated by getting that selfie, doing a yoga pose at the end of the precipice and getting a cool photo. Um, and it's creating a lot of safety issues. People don't realize how long it actually takes to trek out there and they're unprepared. Um, the, the Norway officials that, that manage that site um, have a huge number of rescue operations, um, more so now than in, than in past years to rescue these tourists. Um, another example that I'll bring up is um, a few years ago, a photo went viral of a girl who was visiting Auschwitz um, and, and took a selfie of herself with her you know, smiling face in, in front of the gate of, of Auschwitz. Um, and it went viral for, for the right reasons. People were really upset um, that um, that kind of um, mentality was being taken to a, a site that really needed to be treated with more respect and, and dignity. Um, so I think that's a major issue. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to solve the issue of, of uh, civilization collapse that, that you mentioned. Um, but I think if I could advocate just for one um, solution to all of this is we really need to be thinking not just about adaptation to the current problems and these short-term solutions like moving visitors over here instead of over here and, and maybe changing um, uh, the sites that they're visiting, but really thinking about systems change and how to mitigate these issues before they happen. And the way that we can do that is by changing how destinations are managed at a systems level. And like Martha was saying earlier, the issue is that a lot of destinations don't have a centralized management structure or it's kind of unclear who's doing what, it's, it's multiple different sectors. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that um, destinations like national parks that have a, a clear mandate and a clear management structure do a lot better. And especially those destinations that are um, driving forward solutions in collaboration with local communities in an inclusive and collaborative way are the ones that are doing the best. So I think we really need to, to look at those structures at a systems level. I love that. And I appreciate you uh, batoning that or kind of setting the tone on that. That, uh, And I, I didn't expect either of you to solve our civilization framework problems, but I think we, we tend, uh, many, many of us tend to forget the history behind what we're actually taking a photo of, that that was a pretty advanced civilizations in many respects, that they're no longer here, but yet because we have cameras and smartphones and computers and, and innovations, we think that that might not happen to us, or we don't put that same reverence or that same type of thought process that, boy, Am I contributing to the collapse of humanity with the way I live and the way I travel and the way things happen? And, and it, it seems so minuscule because it's one individual, but it's one individual types, times billions who travel every year and uh, eat every year and do things that that could lead to, to a similar collapse. Um, Maybe it's the collapse of the selfies, you know. I, I don't think that's it's that bad, um, but it, it has definitely pushed over tourism. It has definitely pushed some things in, in, in a different uh, different ways than it should. Um, we're we're running out of time, so I'm going to just ask you two more questions, and that is the the burning question is the hardest one I have for you today. It's WTF, the burning question, but it's not the swear word. It's what's the future? What's the future of tourism? Do we have a plan to be more responsible? Well, you know, I think that the, the good news is that we've made a lot of progress. I mean, historically, we can trace the origins of ecotourism, which is the first sort of term 
within the tourism field that had a kind of ethics behind it. it was not just describing the kind of travel as nature travel or historic travel does, urban travel and so on, but it actually had, um, it, it talked about the impact of travel and that done well, it can be positive. And from the original concept of ecotourism, we've seen a sort of flowering of all kinds of other, other terms that, and some of these terms are used more in one part of the world than another, but the, the most recent term to kind of emerge in part through the pandemic is regenerative tourism, leave a place better than you found it, as we've talked about. All of these terms, I think, have within them the same core set of values to be light on the land and benefit the environment, to respect local cultures and benefit the, the, the local community, and to be educational as well as enjoyable for the traveler. All of them have those same, those same core principles. Um, and I think we've learned a lot. We've put a lot of meat on these original terms and these new terms over the years through, as you mentioned before, Mark, certification programs, setting of standards and so on, and really trying to define what we mean by sustainability or not just use the term for greenwashing, for marketing, but really to put some criteria for how we measure that this tourism is not doing harm, is actually doing some good. And so we, the good news is that I think we have the tools to do sustainability right. We have developed those. And we have also expanded from the, the original sector of ecotourism, which is basically nature-based tourism to, as Kelsey talked about, really applying these same principles and good practices across all types of tourism. So that someday the whole tourism industry, if, if done correctly, should be sustainable. So it is spreading to, you know, to resorts, to, you know, large scale mass market tourism as well. We've got a long ways to go, but at least it's, it's recognized that that's the direction we need to go in. So we've got, we've got the tools, we've got a sense of direction, we've got, you know, a, a breadth of how we're applying those tools and so on. This, this is all good news. On the other side, we've got, you know, flanked a very powerful and engine of mass tourism and a propensity to measure success in terms of more numbers rather than a higher quality of visitation. Um, and this, this is a huge challenge. So we've got huge challenges, but the good news is that we do know how to, I mean, if we pay attention, the tools are there and the, the, the path forward is there. It's not as if we're stumbling around in the dark. We know how to do it. So I, for that, that's what keeps me feeling somewhat optimistic that we, you know, we can do it um, if we put our minds to it. And a lot of people are working on it. Do you want, want to add anything, Kelsey? I think Martha summed it up really nicely. Um, I'll just add one, one thing and say I'm really heartened by this kind of next generation of travelers that mm. um, really do think about sustainability. Um, and there's also data that shows that um, millennials and Gen Z um, are willing to put much more money into um, uh, companies that are doing the right thing, um, thing that, things that they perceive to have good ethics behind them, especially when they travel. And I think that's a really good thing. The last question for each of you is, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message, you know, especially one around tourism? Well, one, I don't know what Kelsey will say, but I, I think one thing that I have long felt and continue to feel is that Tourism is often looked at as kind of a, um, a light industry, a for fun industry, not something to be taken really seriously. And in fact, it's the largest um, service sector in the world, employing more people than any other and having a huge impact, particularly on vulnerable communities and vulnerable uh, destinations around the world. So 
we need to take planning for our travel seriously, as seriously as we take the brand of coffee we drink or where we send our kids to school or where we decide to live or whatever. We, we don't check our values at the door when we head out on vacation. We need to take time, plan ahead of time, make sure that we are doing the research. And it does take some research. I mean, doing the, the looking to, to try to pick a, a path for travel that is both, you know, educational for us, enjoyable for us, but is also respectful of the communities and the environment where we're traveling and leaves as much of our resources within those communities as we can. That takes some work, but it's our obligation to be doing it. Yeah, and I will just, if, I, if I'm thinking about what message is really going to sit with some of the, the listeners that we have today who are all, I assume, travelers. Um, I'll just repeat what I said earlier, that um, travel is a privilege. It's not a right. Um, when you go somewhere, treat it like you're, you're visiting a neighbor's home and you want to leave it better than, than how you left it. Um, and don't just take travel for granted. And we've learned that over the past year and a half now that, that travel um, is to have the disposable income to travel, um, to, be, to have that freedom of mobility that's not restricted by global health crises and hurricanes. Um, it's not something that everybody has. And when we visit somewhere, it's an incredible opportunity to learn about the place, to, um, meet the people that live there and learn about their way of life and and see what they can teach you and to really go into travel with that mindset and i think it makes a huge difference when it um relays into your actions as a traveler thank you both so much martha kelsey it's been a sheer pleasure thank you for letting us inside of your ideas sharing your wonderful book with us we're going to put all your links, uh, how people can get the book, how they can look up and, and see some of the wonderful case studies, the research and, and tips and tricks that you've given us in the book, solutions to, to help us for, move forward. It is something that everybody does one way or the other or would like to do. And I think you've, you've uh, presented it in such a fabulous way. I really thank you and appreciate your time for being here. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Thank you, Mark. And we've learned a lot from you as well. Yeah. Um, a lot of really great information was shared. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.